posting uh, related to our community of practice on port and trade logistics. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to uh, take a moment and introduce our moderator, Paolo Martelli. Uh, Paolo is a lead investment officer at the Inter-American Investment Corporation, which is part of the IDB group. He focuses primarily on infrastructure and energy transactions with 10 years of expertise structuring and managing project finance transactions throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm going to pass the, uh, the, the floor over to Paolo, who will be your moderator for the session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Krista. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Paolo Martelli. Uh, for today's webinar, we're fortunate to have three presenters who will be sharing their perspectives on the theme of port management and infrastructure. Before I introduce them, I wanted to just to go through a little bit of the structure for today's webinar. Each presenter is going to be speaking for 10 or 15 minutes. You'll be able to see their, their slides on the WebEx app that should be open in front of you. Um, after each panelist uh, speaks, all three panelists speaks, we'll have a, a, a Q&A session following. Um, please note that you can send us questions at any time. Um, if, you, if you look on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll see uh, Eric's name there at the top. You can just right-click his name and send him a message directly. Eric will, will compile the, the questions and, and we can, we'll get to them at the Q&A session after the, the presentations uh, are being made. Um, let me uh, go on and introduce our, our three panelists. First of all, we have um, uh, Michael Morales uh, that's joining us. He'll be presenting a view from a shipping line. Mr. Morales is the Marine Operations Manager for the Caribbean Sea Cluster at Maersk Line and Sealand. He has over 10 years of experience in logistics, maritime, and land support and terminals with an extensive knowledge of commercial strategy and shipping lines. He will be followed with a view from a container terminal operator by Mr. Pablo Uloa. Mr. Uloa is the, has been the commercial manager at APM Terminals Costa Rica since 2015. A professional with over 10 years of experience in logistics, shipping, and sea terminals in Latin America and Asia, Mr. Uloa has held managerial positions in areas such as project management, trade management, procurement, and sales. Finally, we'll be joined by Mr. Mike Mora, who will be presenting the view from a port operator perspective. Ms. Mora is the President and CEO of Arawak Port Development Limited. With over 18 years of industry experience, Mr. Mora was a key driver in the relocation initiative for the Nassau Container Port. He also serves as Vice Chairman of the Bahamas Chambers of Commerce and as a Director of the Bahamas National Disaster and Reconstruction Committee, and he has also served as a member of the Bahamas Trade Commission and, and the Bahamas. So without further ado, I'll pass the floor on to uh, Mr. Morales, Morales for his presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before uh, coming further to the situations we see after the shipping lines downturn, I would like to, of course, explain you a little bit of the origins of the current situation. If we if we see uh, Eric, can you click the to the next uh, slide? Well, here we can see easily that after a couple of years of a very stable demand and supply relationship until end of 2014 we start seeing a gap that started increasing uh, by, a continuing, by a continuing growth on supply and uh, reduce on the demand. So uh, having a high supply of TUs uh, also caused that the freight uh, came down starting on 2015. You can see market rates started dropping and on 2016, the quarter number two, we can see a slight start of growing of the rates again, but remains actually uh, down compared to the numbers we used to see 
and in 2014. Uh, also, you can see how the compound annual growth uh, decreased uh, on a minus 17%, 17.8 on a year basis. All these scenarios created a uh, cascade down to the industry that we can see affected on year on year uh, on negative yields and negative results to the lines. This also cascade down that many lines receive uh, financial step out from governments or any investors that used to represent them. Also, you can see uh, back, the bankruptcy of Hanjin and a increase on the shipping lines consolidation waves. Uh, we can pass to the next slide. This consolidation uh, waves, for example, we can see uh, several number of aliases between the lines, also another mer a lot of mergings uh, and acquisitions. Uh, for example, 2M uh, Merseline announced a recent acquisition from Habersuit, and also Hyundai will uh, have uh, corporations with the 2M. But all we can see CMA buying APL, uh, CMA uh, Hapagloy with CSUV, uh, the three Japanese lines doing uh, emerging uh, and also united, united uh, to what is called now the alliance. So this uh, for sure has reduced the strength, especially from Asia to Europe or Asia to United States, uh, reducing the capacity and the strings from the, from the, from the shipping lines. Uh, for, no, for those uh, that may believe that not, but actually indeed, those mergings and those long haul situations are also cascading down to the short routes and feeder uh, economies like uh, the Caribbean and in some cases, some places from Latin America. So, uh, this is being causing as an effect of increasing the size of the feeders. Uh, in the past, we, can, we, we, we used to see that, uh, for example, a, uh, a riding solo uh, carrier, we used to handle uh, 1,100 TUs in a determined route. But now you can see uh, that instead of using unicellular, unicellular vessels, now we are going to Panama vessels on the feeders, and two or three, four carriers are riding on the same route. This has also caused a major port call reductions to the terminals. And as well, it has caused that terminals uh, in has increased their risk of losing any consolidated volumes. For example, uh, if uh, a specific line decided in the past that it's now moving their cargo by its own, decided to move to one terminal to another, the risk for that terminal of losing a small amount of movement was, uh, well, uh, uh, very, uh, lower risk, but now, you have four or five carriers on the same vessel that if another terminal gets better or more competitive, those carriers can, could change the other terminal, getting more risk to the, to the terminal losing more consolidated or higher volumes. Also that, for example, us and I know that most of the terminals don't procure together. So based on that, we have uh, found some opportunities to improve, which uh, were divided in three key players. Uh, for the, there are the terminals, the ports, and, and the countries as well. 
Uh, we we see a lot of opportunities to improve in the terminal equipment. There are countries in the Caribbean and Latin America that does not have uh, port cranes, or the port cranes were used to or are from uh, for working or vessels, and they don't have the necessary height or the necessary length to work current feeder vessels. Same, uh, some terminals uh, doesn't have an automatic gates, uh, lo uh, very old equipment uh, in, in, the, in the jar that are also ca causing that the terminal uh, in productivity are very low. We, uh, we need some, some places in the Caribbean to improve of course, the productivity, the reliability, and the idle times in the specific terminals. This is something that has been affected the lines, and now with consolidated uh, feeders, you have more pressures on the schedule reliability, on the performance of those vessels as you are to uh, touching different terminals, having more moves in each terminal and probably uh, uh, less vessel amounts on the same rotation. Another thing is that uh, we can never forget that uh, terminals have uh, more pressure in finding efficiencies to be more cost efficient. Uh, we, the terminals has uh, really, really pressure during the rate situations to find a lower lower rate solution, lower rate ocean. So this is a top priority for each, uh, each line in this moment. Of course, uh, we cannot forget the uh, technologic improvements and communication, the ICT from the terminals. We, we see a lot, of, a lot of issues there, uh, a lot of terminals that has uh, in-house systems that terminal that still work, where work with uh, manual bapleys, uh, well, not bapleys, manual uh, bay plants, for saying like that, and they, they don't provide a, a 2.0 bapley with, uh, for example, uh, uh, all the weight information, the BGM information and stuff. So there is a, a lot of uh, necessity on the Caribbean and Latin America of improvement on the on the IT systems and system operations that the terminals currently using. Regarding the ports, we should for uh, we need for sure to improve the nautical development in some areas. Uh, more uh, many terminals or many ports from the Caribbean and uh, Latin America are used to small feeders, so we need to improve draft. In, in some locations, we need to improve uh, length overall capacity. We need to improve turning bases and uh, also the nautical aspects in some ports to facilitate uh, bigger vessel coming into the to the terminals. Uh, we continue seeing a lot of waiting times in Latin America, and this can be caused for mainly two reasons. One low efficiencies for the terminals because they have low productivity, although they have right now low, uh, less port calls in some cases, but the productivity has not increased, so we can see some port congestions. And uh, waiting time also is being caused by a low or poor service from the local authorities and, uh, for example, pilotage and some cases that the country demands uh, diving inspection prior or after uh, the vessel uh, and the operations. Same for uh, uh, towage service from, in some cases, the, the, the towage uh, companies are from, from the government and uh, the service is quite lousy. So, uh, in the authority, uh, well, I already mentioned uh, the, the, the authority service that needs to be improved 
uh, poor captains in places they don't have, and uh, maneuvers are really complicated, and we don't have, uh, for example, uh, an additional support than the pilot or the husband the agent. Uh, of course, we cannot forget the security. Security is very important for the lines and to avoid throwaways. And uh, terminals need to think, the ones who don't, to uh, get an ISPS uh, certification. Regarding the countries, uh, the countries is a more general expectation that we have. We need to reduce any uh, unnecessary regulations or update regulations. Many of our countries in the Latin America have very old regulations that are not necessarily up to date or up to the uh, actual conditions. So we need to, uh, as a joint uh, venture between terminals, ports, and country, each one have a necessary meetings or, or whatever is necessary forums to analyze and see how can we uh, update or reduce unnecessary barriers to commerce. Uh, we have cases, for example, that handling transit, which is a really key important play for, for terminals, uh, is very complicated. There are countries that have many regulations to transit for, so they are blocking themselves for receiving a feeder, a higher feeder that can do transshipment to, to small countries. Uh, also, we need to promote that uh, specific thing with, uh, we believe for, for the country that they need to promote local commerce uh, by uh, getting faci facilitations to to the end up the end up co uh, customer, which is basically why we are here. Uh, we we see a lot of countries that there are, there are too many steps to do an import to do an export, and those kind of complications reduce the commerce between the between the countries. And last uh, but not uh, less important uh, is that countries need to support investments in the infrastructure, investments in the terminals, investments in the ports. Uh, many of the, the, the things that I already mentioned demand uh, investments, and we have seen that getting approvals from, from, from the poor authorities, from the government, uh, sometimes is kind of difficult in, in, in our countries. And that's something that uh, we need to take in consideration if we want to go uh, at the same pace that the, the industry is going now. So basically, uh, this is my uh, dissertation for, for the moment. Great, thank you, Michael. You, you brought up a, a number of interesting points, and I think we're gonna we're gonna follow up on on, on some of the. Uh, uh, the points you brought up about opportunities for investment. Uh, before we do that, we'll we'll hear from from Pablo, who's the uh, commercial manager at APM Terminals Costa Rica. And just before it begins, just to remind everyone, uh, you can continue to send your questions to Eric um, by sending him a, a message through the, through the chat function, and we'll we'll deal with them later on. Um, but now I see the floor to to Pablo. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to IBB for the for the invite. I'm going to to give you uh, my my perspective as a port operator, and and the first thing that I would like to do as, a, as an introduction is uh, to remind you uh, about the importance of of the terminals, uh, the container terminals in the whole supply chain, uh, and and in that regard. I would say that terminals are as important as any other player in the supply chain, uh, and actually having a very, very uh, direct impact in the competitiveness of, of any country, uh, uh, increasing the, 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 the connectivity basically of, of the country where the terminal is located with the rest of the world. And, and therefore uh, improving, as Michael was saying, improving the, the, the commerce for the country. So just to give you an example, in Costa Rica, after having conducted some studies, uh, our terminal, the terminal we are building, 
the, the impact that that terminal is going to have uh, for the country is basically moving from from having a, a, co a connectivity index uh, similar to the rest of the countries in Central America to uh, to having a connectivity index after the terminal is built comparable to the one that Brazil uh, has or Panama. Uh, so the impact of, of the terminals uh, for a country is very, very direct and very, very important. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I would like to, to, to remind you is that uh, when we build a terminal, we are talking about very, very high investments. Uh, in the case of the project I'm involved in right now, we are talking about a billion, a thousand million dollars, US dollars, uh, and, and therefore it's, it's pretty significant investments uh, for uh, for an asset that cannot be moved uh, to a different place. So, for example, the shipping lines, they invest in vessels, and if, if the vessel is deployed in a given trade, they can move that vessel somewhere else, where, where, wherever they think the vessel can be better utilized. But in our case, as operators, we invest millions of dollars in an asset, and, 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 and we cannot move that terminal anywhere. So what I'm saying basically is that the risk of those investments is, is relatively high uh, because of the lack of mobility of, of the asset. Uh, so with that, with that introduction, uh, I'd like to, 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 to comment on a few points that I have here in my presentation. First of all, as we all know, uh, globally there is, there is a challenge in terms of uh, trade growth, uh, and that challenge is, is shared by the shipping lines, by the uh, exporters, importers, and of course by the uh, port operators. That is making uh, shipping lines, which are our customers, and, and port operators to get a, a reduced uh, return on our investment and a reduced uh, EBITDA level, uh, which is basically uh, on pair with the, with, the, with, with, the, with, the, with the profit levels that we used to have uh, before the crisis in 2009-2010. Uh, the other thing that you can uh, that you can see in the table in the, in the slide that we have uh, right now is is the level of utilization uh, which is in, which I'm showing in the red circle, uh, which for Latin America this is the utilization of of, of terminals, uh, which for Latin America terminals in Latin America is is very low, uh, and it's actually decreasing. So that tells us that that the, 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 the utilization that terminals are having in, in, in the region uh, is not very high. So we have an asset, we build an asset that is not uh, uh, well utilized. And, and, and of course, that is an issue. And, and the last thing that I'm uh, presenting in this slide is uh, the challenge that is uh, facing Latin America specifically uh, in terms of growth, where in the past, the region was actually uh, quite attractive uh, because uh, the region was supposed to grow uh, quite a bit. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not necessarily what is what is happening, uh, mainly in the big countries like Mexico and, and, and Brazil, but also uh, in, in the other countries. So, what I'm saying here is that uh, the projects that we, the terminals that we build, represent a very high investment with uh, not much, uh, or actually zero uh, mobility, and in a current environment uh, which is very challenging in terms of growth. Can you uh, move to the next one, please? Thank you. So, so that's, that's, that first slide was kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the economy uh, situa situation. Uh, but we are also facing uh, some challenges with our uh, customers, which is basically what uh, Michael presented. Uh, the ship lines, they are not doing well financially, affected also uh, by the low growth, uh, but also by overcapacity, so there is more uh, uh, supply than uh, demand. And, and, and so the pressure that our customers are facing has been uh, translated to us as providers. Uh, and, and, and there is a, a combination that is not necessarily the best combination. So there is, there is a crisis that is putting a lot of pressure to our customers. At the same time, our customers, the ship lines, they are 
increasing uh, the size of the vessels that, that they use. And, and therefore, as Michael explained, they need better capabilities from the terminal. They need uh, 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 bigger cranes. They just need uh, terminals to invest more and more. And at the same time, they are uh, our customers, the shipment. They are putting a lot of pressure for us to reduce costs and to be more efficient. So it's kind of a challenging situation where there is a demand for a much better service, more investments, and so on. Yet uh, demanding a, a, a lower uh, a lower cost, and that is of course a challenging as a as a as a terminal operator, and we need to find a way to, to deal with that. Uh, and uh, in, in the region as well, uh, then, then we talk about competition in the region in some specific ports like Samsung, Buenos Aires, and so on. We, we add uh, the issue that in the terminal side, there is also overcapacity, uh, where in those ports, for example, we have four or five terminals uh, and that is also, of course, putting a lot of pressure uh, when offering uh, our service to the shipping lines, and 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 when uh, we have to determine the rate levels that we can that we can offer. And and in some uh, in some forums uh, we have actually uh, discussed uh, in some port operator forum we have actually discussed if we might uh, if we might be making the same mistakes that the shipping lines are doing, and that is. Injecting too much uh, too much capacity in certain uh, locations. So the ship lines they are facing a lot of issues because of overcapacity. And now the question is for the poor operators if the same situation is happening in some of the countries uh, like Mexico, like Brazil, uh, even Panama now with the new uh, with the new project that they have this Corozal project, which is going to add capacity in the Pacific. Uh, so, so it's a question mark that I think uh, authorities and uh, operators and, and ship lines they have to keep in mind on whether there is uh, or there will be a, a correct balance between the supply and demand. Uh, and one last one last uh, issue that I think uh, we are facing as port operators is uh, despite uh, the demand from, from our customers, the ship lines. To invest uh, more money and to offer a better service and to reduce costs, uh, we we actually don't get any kind of commitment from from, from the ship lines in terms of volume and in terms of uh, yeah basically in terms of volume. Uh, so we invest a lot of money, we uh, try to offer a good service. However, there is no commitment on on, on on how much volume the ship lines are going to bring. So that is that is also an issue that we face. Uh, in, 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 in the graph uh, that I'm showing there, uh, basically the important thing is the green, uh, the green area, which shows uh, how uh, in 2000, since 2014 and in 2015, the shipping lines are using uh, bigger vessels. So you can see uh, the, the blue color, the light blue, and the red ones uh, reducing year by year. Those are the, the the small vessels, however, the uh, the orange and the green area they are increasing year by year. That tells us that shipping lines are using bigger and bigger vessels, and for the port operators, that means the need, as Michael mentioned, the need of of investing in 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 more cranes, in more equipment, and and yet uh, facing a uh, pressure in terms of of rate. So it's kind of a, a complicated situation. Can we go to the next one? So, what could be uh, improved? Uh, and this is basically uh, for uh, I'm giving my perspective for the authorities and for the concessions, the way the concessions are are, are done. I think uh, it's important, of course, to to focus on on port infrastructure, but it's actually more important or equally important to focus on the infrastructure around the port. Let me give you as an example. It's, I mean, we don't do anything having the best port in the world if, if for example, the roads, uh, the highways to access those ports are not good enough. Uh, then we are going to have a bottleneck uh, in, the, in the inland side, even if the port is the best of the best. Right? So, uh, logistics and, and infrastructure around the port is, is equally important as, as the port. 
Then the other thing which is connected to the first one is to actually create the conditions to develop the areas where the ports are located. In some countries in Latin America, the, the, the port areas, uh, the, the locations where the ports are built, they are not necessarily the most developed areas in the countries, yet they are the closest areas to the ports. Uh, so those are areas where uh, the industry could be located, uh, taking advantage of the distance, of the short distance with the port. So I think it's important that the, that the authorities think about uh, how to develop those those port areas, uh, taking advantage of of the of the closeness with the with the with, with, with the ports. Uh, in terms of the concession processes, what I can, uh, what I can, what, what we can see as APM terminals is that, uh, generally speaking, in the in the region, the, the concession processes are not as as smooth and as uh, fast as we would like uh, as we would like them to be, and they are not necessarily uh, clear or transparent, and and that is, I think, something that can be improved. And, 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 and they have to be also uh, more flexible and not necessarily thinking uh, on the current needs, but actually thinking ahead, thinking about the future trends. And, 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 and in that connection, uh, that, that, that's why it's very important the concession processes to be fast. In our case, we have a terminal where uh, the concession process took uh, five or six years and so when we uh, design and build a terminal, we are basically building a terminal that was designed six years ago, right? Uh, so the, the concession process has to be fast and it has to, 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 to consider future trends uh, as much as possible. Think of uh, port operators as allies, as, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, we are enablers. We terminal operators, we are enablers of connectivity and uh, we are a key component to increase the commerce of a country, which I'm sure is a goal that all the countries have. So think of core operators not just as a, as a foreign investment, uh, but think of core operators as, as a key element, as an ally. Uh, to increase the competitiveness of, of the country. That's, that, I think, is, is very important. Uh, the continuous focus on environment, I think that's, that's, that's a trend that, that is there to continue. It's never going to stop, and I think it's important to, to keep that uh, mentality of, of, of building terminals uh, in a sustainable way and actually to incentivize uh, the, the best practices uh, both for shipless and for port operators. We have, in Europe, for example, uh, we have uh, ports which offer uh, better rates, for example, to shipless which comply with, uh, with environmental uh, regulations. So environment is, is an, ele an element that is, is there to stay. And uh, last but not least, uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, concession processes, uh, there are countries that are uh, ahead of uh, most of the countries in Latin America, countries like Netherlands, Singapore, China, and so on. And, and I think, therefore, we don't have to to, to invent the wheel uh, here in Latin America. I think we can, we can as, as we say, we can steal with pride uh, the best practices from, from these countries and, and again, implement uh, uh, those best practices in, in our countries. So, just to, 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 to finish my presentation, I think we are, as port operators, we are facing a, a, a challenging uh, situation, which is not only for us, but it's, it's also for our customers, for our for the shipments. But I think uh, if, 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 if the concessions are better designed, uh, that might represent a further uh, incentive for port operators to, to have more confidence in, in investing in, in countries. And one important thing also is, is to look at uh, port operators, not anymore as only port operators, but we have to look at port operators as logistics companies. So the port is not anymore a port. The port in, in nowadays and in the future will be a, 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 a company that can offer different services in the port 
logistic services, consolidation, deconsolidation, and, and so on. So that that is, I think, where where the industry is moving. That that's what I have to present, and I'll be happy to answer some questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, very interesting. We did get a, a number of questions, and, and I'll, I'll share them out um, with, with you and with everyone after uh, the next presentation. The next presentation is from Mike Mora, uh, who, again, is the CEO of Arawak Port Development in Nassau, Bahamas. Mike, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to first thank the IDB for the opportunity to share my perspective, but more importantly, I get the opportunity to listen to uh, Pablo and Michael, which I found it to be very informative. Um, I thought it would be good to start. To, obviously, the photo in front of everybody right now is a, a picture of our port. Um, we are located in Nassau, Bahamas. Um, we operate what is a small port compared to what Pablo and Michael are accustomed to. Um, our island is only 21 by 7 miles, and uh, our population is only about 350,000 persons, but we do enjoy about 4 million tourists. Uh, Arawak Port Development is a publicly traded Bahamian company. We are in the port development and operations business, and while we have over 11,000 individual shareholders, our owners also include many small Bahamian-owned shipping companies and large international carriers such as Crowley Liner Services, MSC, Seaboard Marine, and Tropical Shipping. Our management team comprises former shipping, port, customs, and health and safety professionals. A great deal can be gained by, uh, could we go to the next slide, please? Sorry about that. A great deal can be gained by redeveloping uh, an island's port, but it is necessary to carefully review the existing business and operating environment prior to embarking on a major port development. Uh, for example, a number of Caribbean islands have very old port infrastructure, and the local economies may have outgrown this very infrastructure. Truckers may be complaining that they're spending hours in long lines Carriers may complain of delays getting to and from the berth. Labor may complain that the operating environment is unsafe due to terminal congestion and poor lighting. Customs agencies may complain that facilities are insufficient to uh, perform their duties, and businesses may complain that inventories are inflated uh, due to port and customs inefficiencies. I'm sure you get the idea there. Um, much of what I'm going to share today would be based on my personal experience developing and operating the new commercial port in Nassau. Uh, we are fortunate to receive uh, approximately 3 million cruise passengers annually, and these visitors disembark in the heart of our capital city, Nassau. Prior to 2010, we had four private cargo wharfs in close proximity to the cruise pier, and many mornings you would find our retail merchants washing their storefronts in order to remove the dirt that had been kicked up by the passing of the heavy container trucks. You'd also see tourists... Uh, you know, scrambling across the street uh, just to avoid the trucks. Uh, the business community lobbied the government to relocate cargo operations, citing cruise passenger exit surveys which spoke to a dirty and unappealing city. And this was supported by the fact that a large percentage of the cruise passengers chose to remain on board. Beginning in 2005, I led a private sector effort to relocate commercial shipping from downtown Nassau to an alternative location identified by the government of the day. A business plan was produced and close to a million was spent on studies, trips, consultancies, etc. And in 2007, uh, the government changed and a new location was identified requiring new studies. I'm sharing this because I believe it highlights the risk associated with partisan produced national infrastructure plans. Beginning in 2009, a P3 was developed and served to accomplish the following. One, it permitted the private sector shipping stakeholders directly affected by the port relocation and consolidation to invest in the new port entity, and they contributed 40% of the total equity. Two, it permitted the private sector to retain control of port operations in order to promote efficiency and a commercial operating perspective this also resulted in significant market confidence in that it really helped us in terms of our uh, financing. Three, it permitted the government to obtain new income stream equating to 25 cents of every dollar collected by the port company. Four, it permitted the government to develop a modern 100 million port with only a $20 million investment on their part, 
which today returns $7 million per year to the government's public treasury. And they did this without incurring any government debt. And five, it permitted the broad Bahamian ownership with over 11,000 shareholders via an IPO that was launched in January of 2012. In 2010, we broke ground, and, and in 2012, after investing the $100 million, a 57-acre port was developed along with a 15-acre inland freight terminal. There were many expectations associated with the project, with the most popular being that a new port would lower the port fees and pave the way for the redevelopment of downtown Nassau. Today, we are fortunate to be able to promote that A, vessel operations now take 40% less time, truck turn times are 60% less and take only 19 minutes, and that's bringing uh, an empty in and, and taking a, a full load out. Customs controls have been amplified due to improved facilities and a strong partnership with the Port Administration. And lastly, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank ranked the Nassau Container Port number one in its 2016 12 Port Regional Efficiency Study, which really looked at domestic, what I'll call domestic ports, not the larger transshipment ports. Our project, like many others, offers valuable lessons, and I've, I've identified here a few uh, for your consideration. Um, the first of which is, um, as noted above, uh, but worth saying again, it's best to approach a port or major national project with a bipartisan supported plan. Secondly, uh, ports generally rely on cargo throughput to pay the bills to include financing costs. Old, fully depreciated and dilapidated ports have a cost base significantly less than that of a new $100 million port. The port tariff may need to reflect higher port fees given the significant investment. The cost benefits associated with a new port must consider the cost and time savings all along the logistics chain. This includes ship time at berth, the truck time in the port, and the impact on business inventories. Three, uh, the project must have strong political support. It is a must to identify key persons to push and manage the project. The op in our case, the Office of the Prime Minister and the shipping sector are two areas requiring champions. Four, determining upfront how disagreements and conflicts will be dealt with. Number five, the agreement should speak to future growth opportunities in order to avoid expensive delays and waiting on government approvals. The port company must be permitted to expand in areas other than cargo operations. If the company is limited to specific port cargo operations, this will place pressure on the port tariff. Expanding the, port's company, the port company's business may serve to subsidize cargo, the cargo tariff, which may result in lower port costs. And lastly, in the specific case of Nassau, a plan should have existed to swif swiftly redevelop the properties vacated by shipping. Five years later, and this prime real estate in the heart of the city remains vacant and dirty. Again, touching on the original national objectives, it is important that all objectives have a plan. I'm happy to report, though, that our port project has been a success, and we're exploring other port development and operating opportunities. My next slide will speak to the port development considerations. We could switch to the next one. And I, you know, believe it or not, um, Michael, Pablo, and I did not collaborate on our presentations because I, I find that uh, much of what they have said I'll be echoing. Uh, the shipping industry is highly competitive, and carriers are challenged in that the market, for the most part, views the service as a commodity with the rate and transit time often being the determining factors. Rates are set by the market, and the carriers work to reduce costs to their lowest levels. Carriers are not obliged to tolerate port labor, customs, and pilot challenges. If a port and or the associated services are inefficient, the carrier will push for improvement while considering port alternatives. The port authority should routinely evaluate the port services and measure against established key performance indicators, or KPIs. The KPIs should be developed in consultation with the carrier community. It is important to understand that the development of a new port on its own may not equate to additional vessel calls and an increase in cargo volumes. For example, Haiti, with the support of the World Bank and USAID, is planning to redevelop the port of Cape Haitian. The import clearance process in Haiti can take as much as 10 days, and the vast majority of Haitian exports are shipped from the Dominican Republic. 
the investment of $65 million in Cape Haitian on its own is unlikely to noticeably return export traffic to Haiti's ports without the successful and simultaneous effort to modernize Haiti's customs processes and to deal with its pilot challenges. My understanding is that Haiti recognizes this and is presently amending its maritime legislation and embarking on customs modernization initiatives. Ports should also be encouraged to invest in technology. The investment in a proven terminal operating system, or TOS, can serve to link port operations with a national, electron sorry, a national electronic single window, or ESW. A TOS can introduce the early planning of operations operations, which not only reduces time, but the cost of operations, and it enhances national security effectiveness. Prior to the opening of the Nassau Container Port in 2012, the government of the Bahamas was challenged with policing international freight operations on the various wharfs, and instructions to place holds or seize cargo were delivered by phone and left to personnel stationed at the port to implement. Today, Customs has access to the port's TOS and the Customs Investigations and Risk Management Departments have the ability to place holds on freight with a simple push of a button and without being on port property. The TOS has also improved the safety and income of the trucking community. Today in Nassau, the TOS produces a ticket that tells the trucker exactly where their container can be found. It simultaneously sends a message to the terminal yard equipment so that the CHE operator can begin to dig the container out of the stacks while the trucker is en route. I also wish to note that we will shortly move to a smartphone application which will provide even greater efficiency to the trucker and trader. The trucker's time in the port has gone from 50 minutes to 19 minutes. Furthermore, a 19 minute truck turn time means that the trucker can now not only make more deliveries in a day, but may be able to reduce his delivery charge. It is also worth mentioning that a port which can turn trucks and ships faster can handle more volume through the port, maximizing the return on the port investment. My last comment speaks to the pursuit of transshipment volumes. My personal belief is that in the case where a Caribbean government is contemplating the development or expansion of its port in the hope of attracting transshipment cargo, the government should have its national objectives clearly identified. What is the country expecting to get from the deal? Some countries have provided generous concessions to ports that have a single transshipment carrier as the investor and anchor tenant. This model would undoubtedly bring volumes from that carrier slash investor. But what other consequences may result? Will the carrier investor, investor have influence over berth access and availability? How will competitors of that carrier investor perceive a port that has a dominant carrier investor? And I know that Pablo is speaking to the risk of overcapacity but my comments are really coming from the other end of the spectrum, a case where there's a partnership with a, with a single carrier, and, and I'm speaking to the, to the concerns and the risk associated with that. On the point of the efficiency of the logistics system within and also affiliated with the port, as previously mentioned, carriers demand efficient and reliable systems. Large transshipment ports are moving towards terminal automation, a result of which is the terminal will employ less labor. If significant increases in employment are the primary um, justification for a transshipment port development, I respectfully suggest that the government look past the port and to the hinterland. It may be helpful to review the Singapore, Busan, Newport, and Panama's Cologne free, free trade zone models. The larger transshipment port developments today are building ports that are low cost, efficient, and semi or fully automated. Behind each of these ports exists warehousing, support services, residential investments, and employment. The increase in employment may be realized in the hinterland and not necessarily in the port. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. Really, really appreciate your, your presentation and your, your insights. Um, now we're going to move to the, to the question and answer uh, portion. So again, there's still time if any of the listeners would like to send um, uh, a question to Eric uh, through the application, uh, feel free to do so. We, we've collected a number, um, and I'm going to start with a question for, for Mike, just following up on, on your presentation, and I'll invite Michael and, and Pablo to, to follow up as well if they, if they wish. Um, 
Michael, I mean, you talked about the success of, of APD sort of, and you, you mentioned a number of uh, success factors in terms of, you know, bipartisan support was important, um, and a number of other sort of factors. I wanted to know from, from your perspective what you think in terms of having other successful private sector port developments, should, should the push be more from the private sector to have these things happen? Should the push be more from, uh, from the government in terms of them reaching out to perhaps other players to try to make this thing happen? What, what do you think uh, is a successful way to have these projects go forward? Well, I think that um, I think the private sector has to lead the effort, in my opinion, because I, my experience with governments, um, governments only change when they have to change. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, to engage the local chamber of commerce, to engage the, uh, the shipping community, uh, to in include, uh, you know, terminal operators, stevedoring companies, um, carriers, uh, and to speak about the possibilities of, of what, you know, new investments, you know, can yield in terms of if we, you know, we make this improvement to the port, if we make this improvement to IT, if we uh, address the, uh, the customs issues, I think throughout uh, the region, uh, for the most part, you know, one of our biggest challenges is just getting cargo off the dock uh, onto the ships or uh, out the gate uh, to the importer. Uh, so I, uh, my personal perspective would be to, to uh, you know, engage the private sector and, and to make a lot of noise, respectful noise. Thanks. I don't know if Michael or Pablo wanted to follow up. I will say the same as uh, uh, tomorrow uh, that you have to let the private sector to be the motor. Also, the private sector that probably is going to do the investment, but they need to find alliance with the local commerce chambers. Any ones uh, that can be involved in, in the situation and, hang, and can push. Uh, uh, on a different directions, but through the on the different sides to the same direction to the government. Uh, that seems like the, it's a common factor that our governments here in the Latin America uh, uh, not necessarily are looking the same things. Also, that they need to to I would say that as authority varies so much. Sometimes they what practically governments need is is really to be fed down on, on information and what is the interested uh, uh, based on the country uh, perspective and the benefits, not only for the private sector, for, for, for the entire community. Michael, I think it's, a, it's an important point because I think oftentimes perhaps governments might not have all of the information or might not be aware of of sort of the extent of, of the costs and the benefits of, of certain, you know, investments or let's say privatizations or some sort of PPP structure and, and uh, it's, yeah. it's good to know sort of the private sector can help sort of uh, fill in that, that gap of uh, information as well. Yeah. Um, a question um, talking about earlier in, in, the, in the webinar today, both Michael and Pablo, you spoke a little bit more about um, some of the trends in the industry in terms of, uh, you know, volumes being down uh, and sort of consolidation. Um, what do you guys think is, is the future of port investments going forward in, in this type of atmosphere? Do you see more consolidation? Do you see um, or other, other issues or trends coming up? Uh, well, in, in my opinion, I, I mentioned uh, a series of uh, improvements that we need to take care of in the Latin America in terms of infrastructure, equipment, uh, technology, communications, everything. So I will say that that, that will depend. We need to say that this is not a uh, uh, every everybody's size custom. This is is uh, this is something that that need to be uh, analyzed and fit to every specific country necessity. Necessity. So uh, 
I believe that 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 we need to do a lot of investments in the Caribbean, uh, the the merge, the consolidation. Uh, as far as we see, will continue. Uh, we cannot predict that it will uh, how it will continue, but it's, it's, it's continue. Everybody is trying to look for efficiency and uh, in order to survive in the market. And for that, every every terminal must take in consideration based on their local position based on the the carriers they are receiving now, based on the volume, how is it the volume split, how the their mix is they have a, a more, more more transit than local cargo. You have, they have to take in consideration the local pop, uh, po, uh, populations of how said about uh, and so you have to take in consideration everything, all the outside the factors in order to decide where you're going to, uh, to direct your investments uh, and if it's necessary for you to do the investments. But in many locations that I work on right now, I see that there are many things to do, a lot of improvements if they want to continue following up the, the current situation of the shipping industry. Thank you. Um, a question that we received, um, and this might be interesting because, because we have different perspectives here on, on this webinar, um, was that from a port operator perspective, but Michael will, will let you respond as well, what are the main factors that you observe being considered by shipping lines when they decide to serve a particular port? And I think, Michael, from your perspective, I'd like to hear it sort of as a, as a shipping line, basically, what would be one of the, the, the factors that you observe uh, is, is being sort of key when you guys decide on, on which port to, to head to? Well, taking out the, the important part that the words, first of all, uh, if I want to go in a specific country, of course I, I need to, I, I like uh, to go to a big uh, economy where we have, a, uh, can provide us uh, in, enough uh, volume. Of course, if it's deciding between an, a terminal uh, versus another terminal within the same country, we have to analyze a lot of stuff. Uh, we need to analyze uh, a lot of varieties uh, uh, that can affect us. As, as uh, Pablo said later on, uh, you can have a great terminal, but if the roads are not good, Ter uh, customers will prefer the other terminal that maybe is closer to the to the industri industries closer to the city. So we have to take a lot of uh, things in con in consideration. Uh, but one of the most important we take in consideration is uh, the capabilities of that terminal in serving us and the cost on going there. I will say that those are the first one cost. And the, cap and, the, and the capabilities on, on, on serving us. Great. Michael and Pablo, what's, what's your perspective from, from the other side of the same coin? Well, this is Mike. Um, I would, all I can do is, is echo what's been said, basically, and that would be that the way we would look at it we recognize that, uh, you know, the most expensive asset that the carrier has is its ship. And so it only makes money when that ship's moving back and forth. And so we need to get the ship in, get it discharged and loaded back and out. And then, uh, you know, to the costs, you know, what are specifically the port costs associated with that call? Uh, but the, obviously there's other things, you know, who's going to provide the chassis? Are there, is, are there sufficient chassis available in the market to, to uh, you know, adequately serve the carrier? and the carrier's customers, um, you know, making sure that, that uh, customs is showing up when they should show up, uh, and then the volume opportunity, you know, when the carrier does come in, when they enter the market, you know, what is that opportunity uh, for them? Uh, because we, we recognize that it, it's in our best interest as a port operator uh, to keep our customers financially healthy. Um, and what I mean by that is that if we happen to have three carriers calling on our port, you know, we need them all making money um, because if, if one of them isn't, then, you know, they're likely going to leave at some point. So that's what I have to offer. Thank you, Mike. 
Um, thank you. Another question that's, that's come up is um, is about value-added services at ports. We, we, we've heard from, from our end here at the IDB from both sort of public and, and private entities about um, people wanting to add value-added services to their ports, such as, you know, logistics hubs or centers and so forth. Um, in, in, in all of your opinions, maybe we can start with Pablo, um, what are logistics hubs really a necessity in today's market? If so, what, what type of sort of enabling type of uh, factor should be there in order for, uh, for these types of projects to, to come about? I, I think uh, I just got a message that Pablo's having audio problems. That I, I'll throw it over either to Michael or, or, or to Mike Mora about uh, value-added services at ports. Uh, Mike, do you want to take that, or shall I go first? Yeah, you go ahead. Well, uh, value-added services, that will depend to whom? to me as a carrier or to the end customers. Both are important, but they are different. For, for me, a value service is that the terminal has, a, for example, a good system that can provide me on-time gate moves, on-time low on discharge move, uh, an accurate and departure badly. Uh, that has, a, I don't know, a, a good uh, scheduled uh, service that they can provide, uh, uh, for example, what else? Uh, any additional service to the line, for example, they can co coordinate uh, even uh, husbandry or chip chambers or whatever is n uh, a necessity for, for the line. But as Mauro said, what we want is basically vessel arriving, coming in, discharging, loading, doing the operations, and sailing out as fast as possible at, at the lower cost. That, for me, is my core. However, for a, the other customers, we want a good customer service from the terminal, lower storage rates, uh, uh, easy, uh, agree, uh, a, a big line of services like verifications, stuffing, stripping from the cargo, uh, including facilities from, from local customs or any other authorities that may help the customers to, uh, to, to release their cargo on time. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, uh, really fast uh, service of delivering the empty container for export, same from the import. Uh, for example, 24-7 uh, scale time for the customers so they can, the commerce doesn't stop. Uh, same from, for 24 7 for the, for the line that they, we can operate no matter if it's a Sunday, no overtime cost. Things like that are at, at the value service. Uh, also a, uh, a web page that we can see our inventory. Same for the customer where they can pay online. Things like that is the things that Motor terminals are doing right now. Uh, they are trying to facilitate commerce, not only for the carriers, also for the customers. That's a key differentiator that that is necessary for for a terminal to another to to separate from from the rest. Uh, this is Mike. I, I would um, you know just all I can do is add a couple of points. And that would be that all of the services or most of the services that were just mentioned, um, as a port operator, I think for us to try our best to um, at least have uh, you know two entities providing those services to try to create competition within the port uh, so that the carrier or the consignee uh, or the shipper doesn't feel like they're held hostage to a, you know a single entity. Um, I would say the other thing would be that, you know, a challenge for smaller ports uh, like ourselves that have recently gone through a major development is that, you know, we're having to compete with ports that, as I mentioned, you know, really, you know, they've depreciated uh, their investment years ago. Um, and so their cost base is much less than ours. And so from a carrier's perspective, the carrier, you know, is, is a little anxious, not a little, they are anxious about calling on a port 
uh, that has high port costs. And so, you know, what can be done to try to move uh, the billing of those costs and services uh, to uh, the local market and, and away from the carrier? Uh, so that from the carrier's perspective, you know, their fees are, are minimal. Um, and that's going to help, you know, improve what we'll call the carrier competition. Thanks. Can, can, can you hear me? Sorry. This is Pablo. Hi, yeah, Pablo. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. No, I mean, I think the, the, the comment that I have is, is in line with what, I, with what I mentioned during my presentation. I think we, I think uh, thinking ahead and, and looking at the uh, the role that terminals will have in the future, I think, as I said, terminals will not be, will no longer be only terminal operators. I think we will we will be logistics uh, companies. That's probably applied more for the mid size or big uh, terminals. But we cannot continue. I mean, considering the crisis that we are going through. And, and therefore the need for more uh, revenue, but also considering the needs of our customers for having a, a single uh, contact contact point and, and having having a, a smoother uh, logistics and, 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 and taking advantage of uh, of having uh, the entire logistics or, or most of the uh, logistics tax in the in the in the terminal itself, I think. The future for the terminals is to to become more a logistics company, providing the, the yeah the range of services that the uh, that 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 the speakers have have mentioned already. Uh, but I think we have to include more uh, activities like consolidation, the consolidation, trucking, uh, customs clearance, uh, inspections. Uh, in our case, for example, in Costa Rica, facilities for uh, handling reaper cargo and so on, and and that's the way how I see uh, how I see the future of uh, terminals. Great, no, thank you, thank you, Pablo, for that. I'm happy that you could you can make a, a contribution there, uh, despite the audio difficulties. We, we, we've received a number of other questions, but we're going to need to wrap up uh, so that we we finish on time. I want to uh, thank. Uh, first of all, all, all of the uh, contributors um, really appreciated your, your, your insights um, onto this, you know, interesting and dynamic uh, sector. I want to thank all of the uh, listeners as well um, uh, for listening and for sending along their, their questions, and also give thanks to the Connect Americas uh, platform for hosting. I'll, I'll pass the word over to, to Krista for some final words. Thanks very much, and just let me reiterate uh, those words from Paolo regarding, um, you know, thanks to our panelists, thanks to our participants, uh, thanks as well to our moderator today. Uh, we'll be sending the link uh, to this recording along with the presentation uh, to you in the coming days uh, to remind you that this webinar is part of a series uh, that we'll be hosting um, over the next year, uh, part of our community of practice on uh, port and trade logistics. Uh, feel free to also send us an email uh, if you wish further information on this or other topics and if you would like to propose any areas which you think might be of interest in which uh, we can provide and, and disseminate knowledge uh, to you. Thanks very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.